All right, we're live. So, hello everyone. Welcome back to another Quantum Matter seminar. It's my pleasure today to introduce you to introduce uh, Janes Boncha from uh, Ljubljana, uh, who's going to be talking about. Uh, uh, All right, we're live. So, hello everyone. Welcome hello. back to hello. another Quantum. Uh, sorry about that. So, who's going to be talking about uh, the Polaron problem with optical phonons? Um, please, Janes, go ahead. Oh. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so this this seminar will will actually have two parts. Um, one part will actually be about the. In, in both cases, I'm going to discuss essentially the Holstein polaron with the single electron, but of course multiple quantum uh, quantum phonons. Um, and the the first part will actually um, uh, I will devote to the finite temperature properties of of this model. And then the second part uh, to uh, to the case when the optical phonons actually have dispersion. Um, so it turns out that neither one of those two cases have been investigated quite a lot uh, in in for this model, of course. So um, yeah. So anyway, so let's begin. Uh, I guess I have about forty five minutes now, or something like like this. Yeah. Okay. I see the time. So um, so. Uh, not so many collaborators because it's a very simple and you know it's not um, this work does not kind of uh, contain any real experiments it's just a theoretical work um, so most of you probably know this these persons uh, Stuart from Los Alamos and Mona from from Vancouver um, so as as kind of promised so the first part will actually uh, I will talk about the Holstein Polaron without any dispersion, but uh, uh, I will look at the thermodynamic properties. Uh, mostly I will look uh, what happens to the spectral function as one starts increasing temperature. And then uh, in, in the second part, I will go back to zero temperature problem, but then I will introduce phonon dispersion. Of course, just like within the optical, optical spectrum. So I will not discuss any, any um, any zero zero frequency limit or something like that. Uh, so just the optical sp spectrum here, um, and uh, and then mostly then look uh, how this dispersion uh, affects uh, the spectral function and also optical conductivity. Um, so anyway, so this this is kind of in short and. In, before I will just explain a little bit about some motivation and also talk about the, the method, which is actually really simple, but but quite successful, it turns out. So, well, in some part, experimental motivation is coming from rather quite recent works, actually, where they have finally succeeded to, 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 to really detect the uh, the polar and spectral function. So it turns out that this is not so, so easy to see, in fact. So what they took this uh, surface doped molybdenum disulfide uh, with the, the position of rubidium atoms, and that actually kind of made some kind of a two-dimensional uh, electron uh, system on, on, on the surface of this, uh, of this uh, crystal, if you want. So then they measured uh, this... Um, uh, they were able to measure uh, the, the the spectrum, and you can actually see uh, that that these results could could be in principle explained by just like a, it looks like a um, free electron, almost free electron kind of parabola here, which is kind of intersect here by some by some by something. So th this could be essentially phonons, right? And so they, they also do some calculation and so on. So, okay, so this is one part. So the other part is, is mostly the fact that this, this problem, this Holstein model has been studied in, in many different ways. And it's, it's definitely one of the basic problems that, that can still be actually studied in, in, in some interesting limits. So, I mean, so here I just list, I, I'm trying to, to, to use very small font so that you cannot see whether I have maybe missed some of the references, which I definitely did, because there have been really, really a lot of work 
uh, with different methods. So our method is the closest to this variational approach somehow. Um, but then, then there are other diagrammatic methods and also just like the exact generalization approaches, Monte Carlo and, and density matrix uh, RG techniques that are also quite, quite successful, but actually very, very demanding, like computing, computer demanding. So anyway, so this is uh, a lot of work has been done, but definitely it turns out that uh, not very few, very few cases looked at what happens at the finite temperature of this problem, or also what happens if, if you introduce, if you introduce dispersion. So, so in the first part, I will just discuss this, this simple case of the Holstein problem, where you just have a single electron essentially on, on a 1D chain uh, coupled to dispersionless phonons here, quantum. So the method, the method works like this, that, uh, that you start with a free electron in, in, in kind of translation invariant uh, state, essentially. So this is just one state, right? If you take into account translation invariance, this, this can be a state, just one state, electron on some position. And then, then you act with this, with this uh, two of diagonal parts of the Hamiltonian on this state, right? Uh, uh, and you keep acting on it. So what happens, for example, just you can see here, like in the first generation, um, you just create a phonon, a phonon excitation. A this is a phonon, this is a, um, a phonon vacuum here. So you just have a free electron. So in the first uh, stage, you just create one phonon excitation. But then if this electron jumps left or right due to this kinetic energy part, uh, this is still the same state because you have translation invariance, right? So this is this you don't count this this state, right? And then in the next generation, you can create another phonon on this side. Then you have two phonons with the electron on the same side, or now you can jump with the electron left on or right, and then you have these two new states. So we have now three states in the in the second generation, and then you go on and on. So this this method allows you essentially to, to create a, a cloud of phonons that is kind of surrounding this electron. So it, it has, it's kind of has the most phonons on the side of the electron, but then as you go further away, then there is less and less of them. And so, and this you can even define on an infinite 1D chain if you want, or even in 2D, for example. Uh, so it turns out that uh, this way you can actually reach uh, accuracy for the ground state to like 16 digits, if you want, for the thermodynamic limit. But okay, we are not kind of, this is not kind of our main, main idea. Uh, now, uh, what to do with this? So, uh, so in, in this first part, as I said, I will look at the, at the, at the spectral function. So which means that you, uh, the spectral function, when you create an electron, on the state that has no electrons here. So, but it, it can actually have, of course, phonon excitations. And so this I will do at finite temperature, obviously, here. So now, of course, this, this to do this trace, right? Here, to do this trace, uh, still there is, you need a lot of, uh, uh, you, you need a lot of elements. So what, what, what one can do is, one can use this finite temperature Lanthorpe method where you can replace these states with some random states. These states are just kind of random states that are just composed of some random combination of just pure phono states. And then you have to do sampling over these random states. And so, so this is the way that, that one can actually, still using the same method, uh, one can actually compute the spectral function at finite temperature. And then I will show you later that this method works quite well because uh, it turns out that you can derive exact moments for the spectral function, ex exact frequency moments, which can then uh, uh, act as a test of the method. But, but the first thing I would like to show you, this is a, a cute thing that you can actually give some, you know, like kind of some undergraduate students. It turns out that you can compute spectral function for a single site now at finite temperature. So this, this, this problem is solved like in Mahan if you want for zero temperature, but you can also get 
uh, uh, analytic expression for this for this function for the spectral function it, even at finite temperature. So as you know, um, for zero temperature, you you get coherent states. You know, uh, for for a single site, you have co coherent states as your eigenstates. But but uh, but now, if you try to compute uh, the finite temperature, you you also need to have excited coherent states. And so finally, you can get this kind of an expression that is written here, um, uh, which is really kind of well, it's an exact expression for the for for the finite temperature uh, spectral function. So here the temperature is here in, in this beta. So I could actually write here temperature. And so okay, so th th this is for a zero temperature. You get something what you expect. You know these peaks are separated by by omega. And then this this guy here is called the quasi particle peak. So the the weight of this peak here is essentially the quasi particle weight. So this is the weight in the total wave function that is just like a a, a free electron thing. And then as you as you start cooking up the system. So if you want when you start heating up the system, what happens is that that you get peaks that are below this quasi particle peak. You see in this regime. And then, of course, you get peaks on top of it. But um, so this is one thing. So as you heat up the system, then you actually can get uh, some weight, which is below the quasi particle peak at zero temperature. Because essentially what happens is that you uh, you create a phonon, not on the phonon, uh, you create an electron um, on the system that already uh, uh, has phonons in it, right? So essentially, uh, uh, that's why these peaks are, are are now at frequencies that are below the uh, the uh, uh, polaron frequency. So anyway, um, so now uh, let's go to the thermodynamic properties. So what what I plot here is uh, different parts of this Hamiltonian, like the kinetic energy in orange, if you want, the coupling part in green. And then the essentially this is the number of phonons. If omega naught is one, this is exactly the number of phonons in red, for example. And then the blue is actually the the blue is total energy uh, of the system, so the whole thing, as a function of temperature. And so then the question is, up to which temperature one can actually uh, discuss this problem? Uh, because of course you have a limited limited Hilbert space. You don't have infinite amount of phonons available to to go to very very high temperature. So what you do then, you, you look at the, this number of phonons, which is actual calculation, and you just compare this number of phonons with the with the Bose-Einstein distribution function, which just tells you how many phonons you have in the system. If that would just be free phonons, right? And so you see that at, 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 for, for certain temperature, these things go in parallel. And then at some point, you have this crossing, which is the, the, the sign of the fact that you don't have enough phonons in the system to, to ac accurately kind of describe this, this race in the phonon number um, uh, with, with temperature. So this is kind of our top, top limit for the temperature. Uh, up to which we can still go and kind of uh, hope that our results are reliable. Um, so, so here um, I, I, I kind of focus on this is actually our result for a very low temperature. If you want a certain parameters, those parameters are kind of simple, just omega is one, and then electron phonon coupling. I kind of forgot to check. It's maybe one also. I think it's one. Yeah. Um, and so what you see here, there is this quasi-particle uh, band here. Um, and this, um, so if this would just be a free electron, then the band would go all the way up to two. It would be like this, right? So, uh, so of course, due to coupling with phonons, uh, you have a, um, a band which is kind of becoming more and more flat as you, as you increase coupling. But anyway, this is nothing new. There have been other calculations that, that got this thing quite, quite correctly already before. You see, uh, like uh, cluster perturbation theory, for example. Actually, these crosses are even our results because they asked us to, to send 
to, to double check their method against our method. So this, I know that we can get these guys, but, but you see this, this part of the spectra looks like this guy, except that this is black and white. Then there is another approach by, by Mona and her group here um, that actually looks very similar, for example. And this is quite interesting because this is now at finite temperatures. Uh, this is uh, work by mostly uh, Heidrich Meissner and uh, his, uh, his student, Jensen. Um, I was just kind of you know, seeing what's happening here. And, and so, so again, this is, um, this is direct overlap between uh, uh, DMRG method and our method. Uh, at uh, almost very small temperature, this is at some, in, if you go this way here, at, at K0. Uh, and then there is another, another one at, uh, at, uh, at finite temperature, as you can see. So I, I have not shown you finite temperature result yet, but even you see that even at finite temperature, these two methods uh, are really close. And this is at uh, K, K equals pi. Uh, so this is comparison. The blue and red are actually uh, blue is uh, our approach, uh, finite temp temperature Lanzos with this variation space, and this is DMRG. Uh, so, so anyway, so th this kind of looks good. And so this is then um, our our results just um, plotted at, at, at k zero uh, with different uh, couplings. And so you see, this is this this kind of quasi-particle peak that you see here, the weight is actually given by, by uh, as I said, uh, this, this weight is the quasi-particle peak. And then omega naught above, you have uh, another peak and another peak and so on. And then as you heat up the system, you start getting weight below this peak. And so this weight is actually because of this extra kind of heated phonons, in fact, that are already present in the system before you inject the electron into the system. Um, uh, here, um, there is, this is just a larger, larger coupling, and this is something that is usually overlooked in the literature, Nam namely, and this has nothing to do with the finite temperature, it, it, this you can see at the, uh, the uh, zero temperature too, <clears throat> namely, you see, um, this is for omega one, so essentially this peak should be uh, exactly omega above the, the quasi-particle peak. But then you, you see here another peak, which is actually, which has a lot of weight. And so it turns out that this is a so-called bound, bound uh, polaron band. So, so essentially a polaron is usually kind of detached from the continuum. And so if you go omega not above, then you start getting into a continuum. But uh, at, at rather strong coupling, you can actually have another uh, another band which is uh, which is uh, uh, detached from the continuum around k zero, and this is this kind of we call it like a an excited polaron, which is still below the continuum because continuum would actually start around here then. So anyway, so this is kind of a cute thing, but has been seen before, of course. So so anyway, so this is now finally uh, for two different uh, for two different uh, sets of parameters. So this is lambda and omega one. So this is kind of this intermediate uh, re coupling regime, close to strong coupling, and th this is a smaller omega. So so now you can see how what happens as you heat up the system, you start getting kind of weight below this 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 peak here, and then of course everything just gets more and more blurred with temperature. Of course, the smaller smaller omega is uh, it's more uh, difficult to compute with these kind of approaches, but nevertheless, we can get it quite correctly. So, so now imagine that as you heat up the system, it can actually happen that the curvature of this band is starting to change because of this other other kind of excitations that start kind of uh, piling around this this band. And so if you try to kind of, this is kind of very human intensive. If you try to figure out what's happening to the curvature of this band, then you can, you can actually ask yourself, is this effective mass? If you define this effective mass by the curvature here, how much is it changing, right? So, so we kind of try to do this and I'm, I'm not very happy about that, but, but I guess there was some kind of, uh, 
there was a question, what really happens to the effective mass as a function of temperature, of course. So it turns out that this can be a, like, you know, a, a small omega, it could be kind of a non-monotonous function, it goes up a little bit and then down. And then here it starts increasing. But, but anyway, I'm just showing you this. I'm not so sure whether this is all kind of totally okay, but um, um, this, is, this is just one aspect, uh, the effective mass. It can, of course, change with temperature. Then the other thing is self-energy. So, so those who know about this problem, they know that, that usually the self-energy for the, for the Holstein problem, um, it's K-independent. And then the question is uh, whether this k independent case would would actually persist even in 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 a finite temperature. So what I plot here, here I plot the uh, on 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 there is many many curves and these curves are actually just different uh, spectral functions at different k values. You know from k zero down to k equals pi here. And so at the same time, then I plot the self energies and you can see that, and of course there is also as many curves here as here. And of course there is very little dispersion here, at least on, in, in, this, in this first peak. So it really looks like the, 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 at least the imaginary part of the self energy kind of remains, remains uh, K independent and also remains K independent then at, at finite temperature here. So this is, small temperature and finite temperature. Anyway, so, so here, uh, here is another interesting thing, which only unfortunately only kind of works for this simple problem and, and, and only works for, for, for the case when you try to, comp uh, to compute electron addition spectral function. Namely, uh, it turns out that you can derive exact, exact expressions for the fre frequency moment and, and in principle, you could derive uh, not just for the first moment, but the second, the third, and so on also. So it turns out that, that for example, the first, so, okay, so this formula, this is like an exact approach, if you want, you know, for the, uh, if you want to get the amped moment, you have to get the amped commutator of the CK and then do the thermal average of this thing. So this is computing at finite temperature, of course, right? And so the first moment, it turns out to be just the epsilon of K. Uh, so this is kinetic energy. Uh, well, this is just really epsilon of K. It, it, this is not temperature dependent at all. So that the temperature dependence falls out for the first moment. And so, okay, so here it's written again. So you see, so the first moment is epsilon of K and this is just this expression. So there is no temperature there. So that means if I take the, my spectral function, for example, and I do the integral from zero to infinity this way, I should actually get just minus two T, which is, you know, um, hopping is one, for example. So, and, and, and so here is the check. So, so here I do this, this integral from minus infinity to omega, for example. Uh, and so this, this, this is the first moment for, and, and, and so this is done for different temperatures, for different spectral functions at k equals zero. And you see they all go towards minus two, which is actually at k zero, you get minus two, hopping is one. So, so it seems like that something works really well here. And this is the other case. This is uh, moments for k equals pi and for pi you should get plus two. And then you get for the first moment, you get plus two then, independent of the temperature. So this is actually a good check of the method. And then, then the, the further nice thing is that also the second, the third, and so on, of, of course, you could compute more moments. They're also given by these exact expressions where G is a coupling, epsilon is written here, and then the temperature only enters through this N, right, to the Bose-Einstein distribution. And those are exact. So these moments are, of course, exact in the infinite uh, for the infinite system, there is no system size in these moments. And again, you can see, so the dots, I mean, the circles here are our calculations. Um, so essentially moments obtained from the spectral functions and, um, and the lines are actually just these curves here. So, so this, this agreement is really good. 
So, um, so I'm coming to the end of the first part. So let me just uh, emphasize just a few things here. So anyway, it's, it's, uh, as you increase temperature, you start getting this extra weight. Um, uh, and of course, the, the spectral functions become less and less kind of sharp, you know, because of all these states that appear in between. Then, uh, then there is this issue about the polaron effective mass, the way that it's defined through the curvature that, that has kind of a non-monotonic uh, behavior sometimes, but, but for larger omega, it, it tends to increase with temperature. And then, then finally, about the self-energy also um, that remains k independent even at the at finite temperature. So anyway, so maybe this was okay. So this was kind of interesting because this method, even the finite temperature method, seems to work really well. But but here now we are coming or we are going back to zero temperature. We are now cooling ourselves down again to zero temperature, but now we are including uh, dispersion. So so this dispersion, of course, you can, this part of Hamiltonian, of course, you can solve exactly, and you get uh, this type of dispersion, omega naught, uh, and then to, to this part here, right? So this is kind of obvious. And now, of course, this hopping can be either positive or negative, right? So if it's positive, you have kind of a downward dispersion. If it's negative, you go, you have upward dispersion. You could, in principle, in, in real material, you can get either either way, right? I mean, it can happen either way. So, so here, something kind of cute happens, in, it turns out. Um, so, he, of course, this is very dense picture, but, but let's let just look at, at a few things. So, for example, this is, uh, here we have very, very weak coupling. So, a very weak coupling, what happens if you uh, compute so this is now total energy as a function of uh, k here. So of course the, the total energy uh, energy starts at minus two because this is just a free electron. And then if you look at the green curve, it just goes up and up and up. And then since omega is one, at this point, what happens is that it's more favorable for the for the system for the electron to jump back to minus two. And then the momentum is then taken over by the phonon, and then you get this flat band here, uh, uh, which is flat because uh, for this case, this T hopping is zero. So, so this is kind of the standard thing what happens to the polaron, right? This is why you get this kind of uh, um, flat, uh, that's, that's why you get this, this band uh, when you switch on uh, coupling further, right, you get this kind of band that, that is actually very narrow uh, because of coupling of the electron to the, to the phonon. But now if you have finite dispersion, uh, what will happen if you go to the blue, blue case, for example, so at finite dispersion, like this is like, um, this is upward dispersion, for example, it's minus here. So you still have free electron and then then the system actually again sends the uh, momentum of the electron back to zero, and then the rest of the momentum is taken by the by the phonon that also now has dispersion. So we have this kind of stuff. So this is kind of obvious, right? But then if we go to the other case, which is the positive uh, dispersion, uh, the uh, positive hopping t t uh, uh, t phonon here, this guy. So what happens here is something weird. So you go up first now with the electron, and then at this point, uh, you intercept a state which is actually consists of uh, two electrons uh, in around the k equals pi. So, so this, this kind of, um, what is this pink, I guess, this pink, uh, these squares are actually plotted uh, following this pink thing. So you see, you have uh, we have here two phonons, two omega naught, um, and minus four t times cosine k over two. So that means that that you have actually two phonons uh, at uh, at pi because their energy is below one phonon at k zero, in this case, right? So 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 what happens here is that you see this excited state here is a. Uh, uh, 
excited state of two phonons that each have a momentum pi, and then this adds up to zero, right, at the end. So you have a two phonon excitation, and the single phonon excitation can be very high up. Of course, this is a very, very, very large uh, dispersion. This is maybe unphysical, this dispersion. But it turns out that, that, that um, so if we actually now move to this picture here, um, so here I, uh, with the full line, I, I show the ground state, a number of phonons in the ground state. And with the dashed lines, I show number of phonons of the first excited state. And so, you, uh, and here then I change this hopping, this uh, phonon dispersion from negative to positive, right? And you see here at a very small lambda, this is 0 0.05. Uh, of course, the number of phonons is more or less zero right here. And then in the first, and this is at K zero, of course. So this is in uh, this point here. And so, uh, and then the first excited state is just a single phonon, but then this single phonon jumps to two phonons, you see here. And then, but then if, um, if, um, if I increase lambda, then this jump, when the, the multiple phonon state become kind of uh, stable, actually sh shifts down towards smaller dispersion. So that means that this two phonon excitation, which is above the, uh, the ground state, is actually moving towards smaller dispersions. So, so this can actually then be quite important, in fact, uh, for, for, let's say, op optical conductivity, which, which I actually plot here. So as, as you are probably fam familiar, if you look at the, at the optical conductivity, this one has some, uh, it has some Druder weight, zero temperature, right? Has some Druder weight uh, and then some regular part. So here I only show the regular part of, of optical conductivity. Again, this is a zero temperature, this calculation. And now these, these different graphs here are actually uh, taken for different uh, phonon dispersions. So the green stuff is when there is zero dispersion. This is kind of the well-known, um, you know, uh, 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 the, uh, the first peak, I mean, the, the first shoulder actually appears exactly at omega naught above, above zero, right? Because this is when you excite the first phonon and then and then this is kind of due to the band, uh, this kind of, these multiple peaks. If I would have a bigger and bigger system, these multiple peaks become, would become more and more dense, right? And here there would be a two phonon excitation, for example. But now you see what happens if, if I increase this uh, downward dispersion. So positive T, T phonon from, so, uh, from 0 0.2, 3, 4, so on. What happens is that, of course, this guy moves to the right because this, this gap now increases because the, the phonon at K0 is now at omega naught plus two times T phonon, right? But you see, at some point, you start seeing here some, some other, some additional structure which starts happening inside the gap. And, and of course, this is very large uh, phonon coupling, uh, phonon dispersion. Uh, so anyway, so th this, this structure here is actually due to this multiple uh, phonon excitations. And this is actually seen even better at stronger coupling. At stronger coupling, you can see that there is this, there is a lot of structure here, which is below, below this uh, single phonon kind of peak. Um, and, and again, this structure is due to this multiple phonon excitations. Um, the other thing that that is kind of obvious that this uh, this this kind of structure is uh, which is due to the single phonon excitation is is narrowing somehow. So this thing actually narrows here and then narrows here again, and this narrowing is also seen here. If you go with one direction with the phonon uh, with the phonon dispersion, if you go to the opposite direction, so like negative, this is upwards dispersion then this is becoming even more like structureless somehow. So uh, this gap actually shrinks, of course. Uh, this gap goes down because this T is now negative. But then if, if I would have really, really large system, this would just be kind of like a structureless stuff. 
or, or you can see it here as well. So anyway, so this is this is kind of a, a, a nice thing that you start seeing when you in, introduce uh, dispersion. Um, then the other cute thing is this is again a nice problem for students if you want. It turns out that even in the case when you have a, a dispersion, you can actually solve this problem exactly uh, and, and get the spectral function, for example. Uh, so electron addition spectral function you can get, and this is kind of a expression for that here. Of course, it's kind of hard to do it. You have to, of course, there is summation of all these possible uh, uh, multi, multi, multiple phono states here. But, but uh, again, this thing can also serve as a check of our method, because in, in my method, I can just simply put hopping to zero and see whether I will obtain something which, which agrees with this analytical form. And, and then the other thing uh, that this an analytical form gives you, so those are these results here, is that you know if, if you start just with zero dispersion, of course, you have these peaks that we all know uh, 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 this is a kind of old result, right? But then as you start increasing dispersion of phonons, of course, this peak starts becoming, uh, forming a band. So there is a band forming here due to the phonon dispersion. And the width of this band, of course, is given by, by, by this guy. But the quasi-particle part here uh, never actually uh, uh, forms a band, right? So, so this peak remains uh, uh, sharp. But, but this, this uh, like one phonon or two phonon peaks, actually they start forming a band. And so here, this is, uh, here I actually show um, um, comparison between numerics. So the, the orange stuff is just numerics. And then the dashed lines that are here uh, are actually from this formula. Uh, so, so anyway, so this single site this is kind of cute that you can get it for the single site as well, uh, even when you have dispersion, of course. Um, so anyway, so so here is uh, I'm actually getting close to uh, close to the end. So now I just would like to show you this uh, this uh, what happens to the spectral functions. So um, so I just choose a particular value of of coupling. So this column here is 0.5, and this column here is one and um, uh, lambda. So this is electron phonon coupling. And so, um, so here now you can see again this, this uh, polar on band, which is now kind of curved more than at, at zero, right? So for the zero uh, phonon uh, dispersion, you get this band that ends up being kind of almost flat here. But here, of course, you have this kind of cute stuff here. Uh, uh, so the polaron band, of course, now also bends, which is kind of to be expected. So it bends upwards in, in one case, and then it bends downwards here, as you can see in this other case of the uh, polaron dispersion. So now you can also see this tiny dashed line here and here and here. And these dashed lines are given by this very simple analytical formula, which is given here. So, um, uh, so this is just the energy of the polaron at k zero. So this is this point here, essentially omega and energy. This is the same for me. Um, and then plus uh, this part. This is just a simple phonon dispersion. And so you get this thing, you get this thing, and then you also get this thing, right? So, so somehow it seems like that here above this polaron band, you actually get. Uh, just like a, a phonon, um, this is just the phonon dispersion here above this polaron band. Um, and so, why is this kind of important? Uh, it's important when when you when you look, for example, uh, uh, at this this case. So this is stronger coupling. See lambda equals one, and then you see something here which should not be here because here you don't see it. But at stronger coupling, you see this stuff. And this stuff is actually, it, it has to do with this two phonon excitation, in fact, which, which appears in this kind of gap between the polaron band and then the single phonon excitation about this polaron band. So this thing is actually the, the, 
the consequence actually here it's uh, this picture is just a blow up of this guy here uh, so this 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 guy we know is is just this thing right and this guy is this two phonon excitation um, and it, it turns out it shifted much more downwards than it would be due to this uh, to such a simple formula here so this is kind of a it's kind of a cute thing and it happens at not very very large uh, dispersion uh, you can you can actually see um, just finally um, just to show you how how well this method works so here um, uh, here I show um, cases where I have created uh, Hilbert spaces with let's say 10,000 states this would be this guy 43,000 states and then finally like almost like a million states and so you can see that this this uh, how this uh, optical conductivity if you want how this thing converges for a certain value of of, of this dispersion so yeah of course there are these finite size effects but at least you know which way this will go uh, when you go to the you know to the, to the very large uh, system um, and then uh, here for the positive uh, uh, phonon dispersion it seems that the, the uh, these results are even even less dependent on on the number of states used uh, to do this calculation so that means that in this case the method is even more successful to get results that are kind of valid for like the infinite uh, infinite hilbert space if you want right in the thermodynamic limit and then similar here the spectral functions you see it's actually it's it's here it's even harder to find the difference between the spectral functions if you do a 10000 states or if you do 180000 states for example so essentially all this stuff can can be run on 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 the laptop doesn't even need to be mac by the way so um uh yeah so so with this then i'll just conclude um with with this kind of uh, flashing this uh, uh, a few of the kind of maybe most important things and uh, i thank you for for your attention you have a live audience here <laughs> um, <laughs> you have noticed um so thank you Yanis, for for a very nice talk. So let's see if uh, there are any questions from from the audience. Uh, if anyone wa wants to ask a question, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and go ahead. Yeah, Frank. Yeah. Uh, hi, Yanis. Uh, Hello. Very nice talk. And um, and I see we have we have Richard here too. So I'm gonna I'm gonna open up a forum here for uh, a problem that's bothered me for many years now, uh, which. Uh, I tried to tackle using your methodology and didn't succeed. And and Richard can comment maybe on Monte Carlo, which which is the, you know, what I call the BLF model, the Brzezik, Labe, Ferdel, which other people call SSH. You know, so that wow. has acoustic phonon. So that's the more oh. drastic example yeah. of a phonon dispersion. And I have never been able to get your method to work. Have you uh, tackled that problem with? Yeah, I, I don't think that this method would be really good for that, right? I mean, it's, it's really hard to get acoustic phonons into this thing. Okay, so it's, so, okay. It's not constructed. I mean, it's really not constructed. I mean, you could try and uh, somehow um, play around with, with, this, uh, with this addition, uh, with these hoppings. I mean, maybe if you would put further further hopping of the phonon and so on to get dispersion that would mimic that would mimic this acoustic branch but um i never tried but i have a feeling that this may not be very very successful okay thanks uh, and and richard do you want to comment on the quantum monte carlo because i feel like that route has been unsuccessful as well for reasons i'm not clear on you're muted. You're muted, Richard. Okay. Uh, we have done a bit of uh, work with SSH. Actually, a couple of my students are here. They could they could comment uh, better than I. But um, 
uh, we've, we've looked in particular uh, for bond ordered wave uh, transitions as you lower the temperature in the SSH model. Mm. And, uh, and those can be seen. Um, uh, and, and so there are various ordered phases. Uh, we haven't seen much superconductivity in that or in the Holstein model, okay. but I don't know if uh, Shun Han wants to say, or she wants to say more about that. Thanks. Yeah, that's the, the other thing, the problem of, of this method, it works really well for one, one particle. Of course, we, we did quite some, some stuff with two particles too, with two, you know, two electrons. Uh, for the bipolar on, it, that worked just fine too, but, you know, to, to, to say anything about superconductivity, of course, with this method, uh, it's kind of uh, not, that's not the right way to approach. Well, I, I'm, I'm, I don't know, I, I, I might disagree with that, because I, I think the, the two particle work you did was, was very important, and I, and I have a question related to that as well, since you brought it up, which is, um, uh, you never to my knowledge, you never did the two particle work in two dimensions. You did it in one, is that correct? Ha. Actually, you know what? Um, maybe you have missed that work, but um, right. So I, I, we never did a really Holstein model with two electrons in 2D, <laughs> but, but we did the TJ Holstein model with two holes in 2D. Um, which is kind of really crazy, uh, right? Um, but we do have actually a work on that. Um, so, okay. because with this approach, somehow you can kind of tackle, if you, if you imagine, you know, you have a nil state and you put two holes in this nil state, then of course, as, as, lo as long as these, these two holes start moving around, they start making these uh, string states, right? But at the same time, they can also start creating phonon excitations in, in, in the same spirit. Mm -hmm. So we actually did, we did some calculation on the TJ Holstein model for the, for the two holes. So of course you could say you're really idiots, you know, why just, you just didn't do two particles in 2D, but okay. I mean, you know, I tried to do, I wanted to be fancy and to do TJ, right? Because then this was the fancy thing to do then, right? So I did it. And I was also in Japan. I had a bunch of time. There is nothing else to do, just work there. So, you know, it was kind of a great time to do it. I was working with Sadamichi then. Uh, and so, you know, there is really, you know, you, you just do like good food and so on, but then you, you work. There is no sports there. Um, yeah, sorry, this was a stupid answer, but this is kind of the way it was. Okay, I'll, so, I'll look for that reference. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I think also, Frank, there's a uh, recent paper by uh, Mona and John Su uh, just in the last few weeks on archive. I'm trying to find it on. Um, but they, they, they put in, um, okay, they have this, yeah, I know, I know the paper, but they, um, they put in a, a um, they put in a, um, an Einstein mode. They, 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 they talk all about acoustic stuff but then they put in an Einstein mode which oh, was everybody cheat. does because it's hard I think they, they cheat <laughs> yeah. yeah I guess what one thing that's interesting is that they then uh, you know we were just talking about superconductivity then they try to uh, take the bipolar on problem they do and then shove it into an analytic expression um, oh, yeah. uh, oh. and, and infer in particular um, the dependence of the superconductive transition temperature on the uh, electron phonon coupling as I recall Yes, yes. But but why do you think that if one would do a bipolar on problem in 2D, it would be so much different somehow? Because just two particles still, right? I mean... Well, okay, so I've been looking at that problem a little bit. The reason is because in 1D, there, there is no weak coupling regime, right? In the thermodynamic limit, it's always polaronic, like, and, and, and in yeah. particular, the way to, to, that I say that is by making the phonon frequency go to zero, which as you know, makes it harder and harder, but, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. we can, we can make those go um, pretty small. Whereas in 2D, there is a definite regime of coupling strengths where 
where it's it's weak coupling. You can say it's weak coupling and it follows weak coupling trends. And then there's a sharp, smooth, but but very sharp transition to polaronic. And it's in that weak coupling regime where something uh, different might arise in two dimensions mm -hmm. uh, than occurs in 1D. That, that's why I'm kind of... Um, because you, you, I don't know if you know, Giannis, but you know, the Monte Carlo people have started um, work up again on, on Holstein and, and emphasizing that, you know, taking Lambda greater than 0.5 is kind of hopeless. So if they're looking for superconductivity, ah, so they're, ah. they're, they're now realizing you have to stay in the weak coupling regime. And then the question is, what can we see there? Mm. It's kind of the question arising in my mind. And that's why I think the two, the two um, polar on problem, bipolar on problem in, in, in the, even though it's dilute, uh, I think it'll tell you something. Okay. Okay. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, Sasha Chernyshev has a question uh, here. So I have a naive question to your motivational part. So why did they have uh, phonon essentially dispersionless there? Do you have any idea in real system? I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, why? I mean, most of the people just did the dispersionless phonon. Yeah, I know. I don't know, but experimentally, they, they, it looked like they, so much as your figures. So, so why? Uh, I mean, there is always a little bit of dispersion, and of course, dispersion of phonon is kind of, you know, it's kind of funny. You know what? What we also looked. I mean, this was just very little part of the stuff that I did. You know, I, what we looked at, for example, what happens if, if, for example, if you take, you know, this is kind of the big nowadays the big fashion that you do the disordered systems right so like everybody has to do disordered systems so therefore i'm also doing disordered systems so you know i was looking you know what happens to the to the electron if you put it in in the on the anderson lattice so you just the 1d you know disordered 1d and then you switch on phonons and so it turns out that this thing it seems like it's going to kind of uh it's going to delocalize um even, even if you have dispersionless phonons, which is kind of funny because it, one would imagine that dispersion would even help it better to, to delocalize the particle. But even dispersionless phonons do the job. So, yeah. Uh, maybe maybe the second one. So, you, okay, when you write your Hamiltonian, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's always uh, the coupling to electrons is just through the density. Oh yeah, uh -huh. it's tight binding, uh, and tight binding has uh, on-site potential. You basically expand this on-site potential, and uh, you have a gradient of density, but then you convert it to a local whatever. So, so you you can you can do that, but you can also have a coupling fr coming from the hopping. Sure, 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 sure. Or is, is it much harder to do? do you no, with? no, 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 no. I mean, with this method, this would work just fine too. Okay. As so long as it's let's say local. That's yeah. like closer to the TJ business, if you wish. By, yeah, by yeah, yeah. But then, then you at least you know you you know what you couple to because you your your phonon is a displacement, right? So displacement is a vector, so it has to couple to a vector. Mm -hmm. So at least you have a current to couple to, not uh, not some gradient of uh, of a true of, uh, of a density. True, yeah. But you are saying it's your method would work as well. Yeah, this this would work just fine, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Uh, we had a lot of uh, interesting comments uh, from Richard who had to run and others uh, on the chat window. So there are a couple of citations uh, to papers wow. where they look at uh, Phono dispersion, um, one dimensional spirals with uh, quantum phonons, uh, diagrammatic quantum Monte Carlo with acoustic uh, uh, phonons. 
Is so, it possible to save all these uh, excellent ideas and send them by mail or, or because now sure, when you see the Zoom absolutely. is going to be gone? Huh? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, oh, great. Uh, please send me uh, if, if, if you, well, I can send it to the... You can save the chat. I can save the chat and I, I can send this information to the subscribers or, or to anyone who requests. That, that, that would be great, yeah. Uh, to those watching on, on, on YouTube, you won't uh, be able to access this. So please uh, feel free to contact me if you are interested. Um, all right. Um, any other questions from the audience? Um, all right. If not, uh, let's uh, thank Yanis one more time. Thank you for staying late. And well, yes. I'm, I'm already smelling dinner from, from downstairs. So this is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, well, I, I'm really sorry that you know. I, I wish there would be no Zoom, and I would be there with you. That would be even. Yeah, absolutely. Better. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> I will try to invite myself. Don't worry. You know, I'm very good with that. I invite well, uh, myself to you know to Vancouver and Los Alamos all the time. <laughs> so yes, you always uh, visit here in the East Coast. Uh, all right. Uh, thank so, you, Yannis, one more time. Uh, I, uh, Thank you uh, to those in the audience for joining us and uh, we'll see you next week again for another Quantum Matter Seminar.